I am Simon Barrett, as it says on there, and I'm a tissue viability lead from uh, Humber. So, I think we all know that the wound needs the optimum environment at all stages of healing. So, the optimum environment to you is warm and moist. Yeah, so we all want a warm and moist environment. Uh, it can be achieved or assisted in being achieved by uh, providing the right dressing. The dressing hopefully will provide that environment. Um, but again, it's down to your holistic assessment and then the way that you assess the wound. We've all got formularies, hopefully, that we stick to. Um, and hopefully if we do stick to that formula and we do do the right assessment, we'll get the right dressing on at the right time for the right length of time and hopefully then improve our outcomes for the patients. What we have got is this definition of chronicity, haven't we? Now it's been around and it's been, it seems to vary wherever you go. So four weeks is what you would suggest is a chronic wound, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Now that ties in really nicely with the sequin as well because what you've got to achieve is that you've got to improve your assessment, your holistic assessment, your wound assessment for those wounds that are chronic at four weeks or longer. We've got to evidence base that we're doing X percentage of wound assessments. In theory it should be 100% but can you guarantee that you're doing that holistic assessment and that wound assessment? If you're not, this tool might help you. So, triangle of wound assessment. Basically, it looks at the wound bed, the wound edge, and the peri-wound skin. Uh, but also, the big circle still encompasses, if you like, the holistic patient. Because what I wouldn't want you to do is just to focus directly on the wound. It's about that whole picture. Because if we miss out the other bits, then we're never going to get to understand the patient. So it's critical that we ask ourselves when we're doing that assessment, as Alec was just mentioning actually with regards to COPD, has the patient got the appropriate amount of uh, nourishment going in? If you've got a chronic wound that's leaking large volumes of high viscosity fluid, then it's highly likely that there's lots of protein leaking out of that wound. Are you replacing it? Are they getting protein supplements? Have they been seen by the dietitian? If they haven't, then there's a fairly good chance that wound is going to become static stall and it's going to become chronic upon chronic. So we must consider what, what other people do we need to work with as part of that multidisciplinary team. We need to ask ourselves, has the patient got an adequate blood supply? If it's a leg ulcer, is it arterial, is it mixed, is it venous? Have we got that right blood supply? Do we need to refer on? Medication, is the patient taking the medication that's being prescribed? Is the medication that's being prescribed appropriate? Because if you go and see a GP nowadays, or even a practice nurse, you only have X amount of time, don't you, with your GP? Is that fair to say? Is there any practice nurses? One or two. Practice nurses, back me up here. How long do you have with your patients? 10 to 15 minutes. 10 to 15 minutes. And does that include the holistic assessment and diagnosis, treatment plan and dressing? Yeah, it does. Is that a realistic amount of time to do that assessment? Probably not, no. Uh, if you go and see a GP, you might find you've got a 10 minute slot. Patient comes in and the patient will come in potentially, well, I've got to stay close to this, potentially with a leg ulcer. And they'll go into the GP and say to the doctor, right, I've got this leg ulcer. Take a seat, Mrs. Brown. No, no, don't take a seat. You're taking too long to get sat down. Stay stood up, what's your problem? <laughs> The problem is, doctor, I've got this edema in my legs because I'm always stood up. Um, so he says, oh, I know, just the thing for you. I'll give you a tablet. Patient thinks, fantastic. I've got another tablet out. The doctor goes away, takes the tablet, finds the, the tablet for the leg ulcer and the edema in the leg, and it, needs, needs, it makes them go to the toilet more to pass water. Next thing is, they find because they're immobile, they can't get up to go to the toilet, and they end up with moisture lesions. TVN then comes in and does a holistic assessment Oh, why are you taking that tablet? Because the doctor said I needed it. But what, what is the underlying root cause of that edema as part of that leg ulcer? Was it cardiac that warranted uh, a diuretic? Or was it the fact that this poor lady's always sat 24 seven in a Shackleton's ass each year? And all she actually needed to do was elevate her leg. And if she did take the tablet, she potentially would have dehydrated, but she stopped taking it because she couldn't make it to the toilet. So it's about spending that time, investing that time in that holistic assessment at the beginning. Chemotherapy and radiotherapy are going to have a, a slowing down effect on the wound healing process. You're introducing cytotoxics, you're going to, uh, poisons basically, so it's obviously going to slow down that healing effect. Obesity 
uh, affects healing because the blood supply to that fatty tissue is not as quite as good as it was when he was a bit slimmer, he says, breathing in. It's <laughs> funny, isn't it? Oh, <laughs> um, and poor circulation, as we've already mentioned, we need to refer through potentially if it's something that we can't manage locally. Psychological or psychosocial um, parts of wound healing. Does the patient actually want to heal? At the beginning, when you start that assessment, you start to build that relationship with your patient. Does the patient want to heal? Because if they decide, no, I just want symptom control because I can claim some certain benefits through this wound, then you're going to find it an upward struggle. The other problem is, is this issue around compliance. Um, we did a survey supported by Coloplast in 2013 and we looked at almost 5,000 wounds then and it came out that varying between the five organisations that we surveyed, the, the non-compliance was between 23 and 28 percent which if you put in that into the perspective of my organisation that's spending a million pounds a year on dressings alone, that means there's a waste of about £350,000. So we've, we've got to be really careful that we build these right relationships at the beginning. We understand where we're going and we understand what the need of the patient is. Otherwise, it'll cost us all, including the patient with pain and suffering, an awful lot. Infection. If you was going into hospital tomorrow, what would be your biggest concern? I'll just give you a clue. <laughs> infection potentially, wouldn't it? We're all very, very worried about going in and receiving infections and coming out not as fit as we, when we went in. So again, it's really important that we understand when a wound's colonised, critically colonised, locally infected and spreading infection, when we need to swab, when we need to give antibiotics and when we can manage a wound with just a good topical antimicrobial, whether that's silver, honey, iodine, PHMB, whatever your uh, topical antimicrobial is on your formulary. Re reduce wound temperature. Do you remember going back to the days of the old ward rounds? My nursing career started in the mid-80s, mid and yes, you should be looking at me and thinking, God, he doesn't look old enough, but I'm <laughs> maybe kidding myself a little bit on that one. But yeah, my, my, my career goes back to the mid-80s. Now, in those <laughs> days, the consultants were known as gods, weren't they? They were gods, and literally, when the gods were coming, you made sure the patients were sat to attention, they weren't allowed to use the commodes, and we had to stand by the bed, didn't we? And then they'd come storming on, all of a sudden, be called away back to theatre, and the patient would be left there. How would you prepare them ready for this uh, ward round on a busy vascular general surgical ward? You'd strip down the dressings, you'd put a paper towel on that was hopefully sterile and left them there. And there they were laid on the bed. All of a sudden this paper towel became an antimicrobial barrier, didn't it? But it got wet, it got stuck to the wound. So you thought, oh, don't worry, I'll put another paper towel over the top. It was amazing how it fought infection off, wasn't it, in those days? And you could be left like that for two, three hours while they went off, did the surgery and you left them. Hopefully that doesn't happen now, hopefully. But every half an hour that you reduce that temperature of the wound, it, it takes another four hours to get it back up. So that will delay the wound healing process. So hopefully we shouldn't be routinely stripping down and exposing the wound for any length of time. And it's also critical that you don't routinely take the dressing down because the patient says, I want it changing every day. It's what's appropriate to manage that wound. The less you strip it down, the more chance it has of healing. Have you addressed the underlying disease processes that may have caused the wound to be there in the first place? What is the root cause of the wound? Uh, are you looking after the maceration? If you don't look after the surrounding skin, then you haven't got any chance of that epithelial tissue piggybacking across the granulation tissue. So it's critically important that you look after that s surrounding skin as well. Poor wound management, that's us. One of the biggest issues is the way that we select and dress. So if we're not using a systematic approach to the way that we assess, dress and potentially compress some of these wounds, then we're, we're not going to go any further forward and we'll end up with these patients that are stuck on the books for not weeks, not months, but years. Is there anybody here that could top trump this? We had a wound on a lady that started when she was 21 and sadly she died when she was 77 with the still the same wound. Yeah. So I, I might add she wasn't under my care. I'm not that old. <laughs> but she went through, you know, living in this area, in, not in this area, in the Hull, Hull and East Riding area. 
Unrelieved pressure. Now again, pressure also is a massive thing on the agenda out there. But to be honest with you, if we could get access to the appropriate resources, a repositioning equipment and nursing care, then we should be able to avoid most of these pressure ulcers occurring unless the patient's compromised in that they've got peripheral vascular disease, diabetes, something like that, and it may make it a little bit more difficult. Immobility, as we get older, we all become slightly less mobile, don't we? I can no longer run the 100 metres in the time that I could when I was 20, and it's becoming more and more frustrating since my little lad, who's only nine, is not far off the pace now, and he probably has me over the distance. And then we move on to this big issue, I suppose, certainly in the inner cities and the more deprived areas, is substance abuse. Now, I don't know what it's like in Stoke, but certainly in Hull and East Riding, it's becoming known as one of the drugs capitals of Yorkshire. But with regards to substance abuse, it's a, a typical inner city. Uh, there's lots of people unemployed, there's lots of people that uh, haven't got adequate resources, <coughs> things to do, and they resort to substance abuse. Now, that has a knock-on effect because wherever they're injecting, it puts that limb at risk and they can become very compromised. And we then pick them up in vascular. We get them with leg ulcers and such like, uh, the venous or arterial. So it's becoming a more and more prevalent problem. So, simple framework is the triangle of wound assessment. It's three simple uh, steps. There's the wound assessment, the management plan, and the treatment. Now, if we do all those things together, after we've done that good holistic assessment, and we consider that whole patient, the wound, the surrounding skin, then we've got a better chance for our patients. We've, we've got them on side, effectively. So, the first step of the wound assessment, you've got the wound bed, you've got the peri-wound skin, and the surrounding skin. And what we've effectively got to do is try and uh, address all those three components to try and help the wound to move forward. So the first one that we look at is the, the one that's highlighted in the darker blue, and it's the wound assessment. So you're looking at the tissue type, any exudate and any infection that's there. And again, the, the exudate and the infection probably go hand in hand. If you've got exudate pouring out of a wound, then it's basically an invitation for that bacteria to track into the wound. And again, it may be that we consider how we manage that exudate, whether it's through use of foams, whether it's super absorbents, and or uh, how we manage that infection, whether we need to use an antimicrobial. And then what you've got on this side uh, of the presentation, as you look at it, so your right hand side as you look at it, is just some images that talk you through uh, such things as necrotic tissue, granulating tissue, where the slough, where there's epithelial tissue. And what you've got to do is put a percentage in there so that you can outcome track each time you change that dressing, how it's progressing. It also looks at exudate, looking at the volume and the viscosity. So you should be able to see on the first two continuums how it's progressing. And then the third one is looking at the signs and symptoms of infection. So what you're doing effectively is painting a picture Paint by numbers, if you don't remember it, if it's something from my day and you're a lot younger than me, it's basically, it used to be these pictures that you would buy. You'd look at the image and then you coloured it in by painting in all the numbers. So all the 17s were brown, all the 15s were red, all the 14s were green, and all of a sudden it started to form a picture in front of you. And it, my gran was a bit foresighted like me, and she used to think, by our Simon's a good artist, she couldn't see the numbers that I was just colouring <laughs> in. But the problem is, sometimes we tend to deviate away, don't we? We sometimes think we're a better artist than the paint by numbers. And that sometimes happens with us as practitioners. You will start off, you'll go in, you'll do your assessment, you'll make your diagnosis, you'll make your treatment plan, but guess what happens next? Your colleague goes in, who's different to you, who sees it slightly different to you and thinks, hey, oh, I'm going to change this, this is not how it's going to be. So the patient's had a little bit of a pathway of two weeks. Your colleague's gone in, seen something slightly different, slightly deviated from the plan. And then it becomes very frustrating for the person who's done the assessment number one, doesn't it? And then you have a little chunter to yourselves and think, well, she's gone in and done it again, which we did, we've all done. So you're not feeling anything on your own there. We've all done it. But we must try and stick to that treatment plan if we can. So the next part is the wound edge. And as you look at it again on the right hand side, we look at the top image which is showing maceration, the second one's dehydration, 
the third one's undermining and the four, fourth one's rolled edges. Now this one, if you look at it, the undermining, you may, are you familiar with that word? Because a lot of people say, well what do you mean by undermining? Undermining, if you think about it like coal miners, they start with a hole and they undermine the surface. So you have the, the coal shafts going underneath. So effectively, what it means is there's an hole, but somewhere there's coal shafts or there's undermining going on under that tissue that you can see on the surface. So effectively, the wound's bigger underneath the skin that you see. So just remember coal mining. And what, again, you're meant to do is tick the appropriate box to describe what you're actually seeing with your patient. So all the time you're painting the picture effectively. And again, the next section of the triangle that we go on to looks at the periwound skin. And again, it considers maceration, excoriation, dry skin, hyperkeratosis, callus, and eczema. And again, it's about understanding why have you got potentially some of these symptoms here. Have you got the dry skin because it's covered up by bandages and it's not being exposed to, to the air? Is it because you're not cleaning and then rehydrating? Have you got hyperkeratosis for the same reason? It's been covered over, you've got that build-up of plaque, you might have put your emollient on, but you've not cleaned the leg before you've applied it again. So you get build-up after build-up after build-up of plaque. You get scaling effect, and then you get moisture underneath, and then it increases and it includes bacteria. So it's really important that you clean away this dead and devitalized skin. Uh, the callus could be because of the way that we offload or the way that we walk. And again, it's vitally important that we get rid of that callus because it will increase the pressure under that piece of skin. If it's not within our remit, then we should refer on and we should use the podiatrist. Um, and then the eczema. Is this a sound stroke symptom of the fact the patient has got venous hypertension? So again, is this all starting to paint our picture and paint by numbers to allow us to make that good diagnosis? Mm. The second step is the way that we set and manage the goals for the patient. So again, if you look at the triangle of wound assessment again in front of you, each one or each, each uh, component of the triangle has got a management aim allocated underneath. This is all available to you on the stand. Is that correct, gentlemen? Yep. Yeah. It's all available to you. So you can, if you want, go along, take some packs away with you and take a little bit more time to, to discover what's in this triangle of wound assessment. The second, a third stage, sorry, is the appropriate management. Now again, it just depends on what the underlying cause is initially with the wound as to how you initially start to manage it. But then when you start to look more locally and start to focus on the wound and the surrounding skin, is it about how am I going to manage the, uh, the debridement of the wound if it's sloughy or necrotic tissue? Is it about how am I going to manage the skin? How am I going to rehydrate? How am I going to protect? How am I going to manage that periwound skin? How am I going to allow that epithelial tissue to contract and jump across? Because if I don't do all of those things together and I just focus purely on the wound bed, I'm not going to get wound healing to occur. So please, you know, look at it like this. Skin is what? What is skin to you? It's the largest organ in the body, this lady at the front says. Do we all agree? Yeah. Yep. Do we look after it as well as we should? No. no. Well, do I look any older than my true age of 40? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't look after our skin as well as we should. Uh, if we looked after it as well as we looked after all other organs, so say, for instance, my heart, please, God, don't let this happen. But if I was to have a heart attack in front of you, you would all run forward, wouldn't you? Because you can, caring nurses. You'd resuscitate me, hopefully not just doing the Vinnie Jones thump on the chest, you'll give me the full mouth to mouth and I, I want to be brought back to life. But if I was to trip over this mat here in front of me because it's hard in the cables, I reach out, I lacerate my hand, you probably just go, you silly old devil. You might root around in your bags because you've just gone and got some dressings. You might come forward and put a dressing on. But you wouldn't treat it with the same uh, urgency, would you, as my heart? You just wouldn't do it. But it should be valued just as much. It's an organ that's multifunctioning and we really need to look after it. So don't just focus on the wound that's there that you found there. Focus on this skin and what's caused that failure of the skin to happen. So 
just a few case studies uh, to go through if I may. This is with regards to um, how we've managed some wounds within our organisation. So the first case study is a gentleman called Neil. Now you might be able to help me along a little bit as we go. I'll give you a little bit of history about Neil. He's a gentleman who lives uh, in the East Riding of Yorkshire and he's been to theatre and he's had uh, some surgery to reduce his stomach. And uh, the, the surgery was successful, then unfortunately developed a hernia. Went back to theatre, had his hernia um, reduced and unfortunately the wound broke down, it dehissed. So if somebody says to you dehiss, because it's amazing, the other day I went to do some training with some practice nurses and I said, what do you do for dehissed wounds? And they looked at me real blankly and I'd just assumed that everybody knew what dehiss was. So I said, when a wound breaks down, it opens. So if you ever are not sure of what some of these words are, just ask. Because otherwise we talk in riddles to each other and if we don't communicate correctly, how on earth are we going to get these assessments right? So this wound had broken down, it dehissed. Now then, there's a few things that are potentially going to stop him from healing. Just shout out if you can see anything that's going to stop him from healing based on what I've already said. Slough, so there's a bit of slough in the wound. Anything else? Possible malnourishment. Although he looks like he's, a, he's got a little bit of a tummy apron, he could be, <laughs> he could be malnourished, couldn't he? Any, anything else? Underlying disease. Un Potentially. Is there anything that's almost itchy in front of the, your eyes that's really visible? The hair. Hairs. He's got hairs growing into the wound, so that's going to act as a foreign body. Now, the, the, the final thing you'll never guess in a million years, but this guy was going to prove to be very difficult to manage because... In Hull, there's a rivalry between two teams of rugby league teams. I don't know whether that means anything to you. But rugby league is the big sport in Hull. And he supports Hull FC. And I support Hull KR. So he's going to struggle to heal because of that. Because his house was full of Hull FC memorabilia. And he was rubbing it in at the time. So we've got some problems. We've got some slough. We've got some hair ingress. We've got some uh, tummy apron. So the blood supply to that might not be so good. And as you said, we need to also address any underlying disease processes or conditions. Um, so we did those things. We prepared him to heal. He went back to uh, the consultant at this time and he saw a locum uh, uh, Italian guy, it was. And this guy said to him, I won't do an Italian voice because it would be rude of me because it's not right. But um, I mean, it's not right that I can't do one. <laughs> so. He went to this uh, Italian consultant who was a locum and he said, uh, what you need to do, you need to get yourself down to the local supermarket, get yourself some honey and pop it into this wound. So he comes home and says to the nurse, oh, I've seen this consultant and he knows best and he needs me to uh, get this honey, which I've got for you, but he said, will you put it in? So the nurse rang me up and said, what do you think? I said, what do you think? So she said, well, I shouldn't do it. I said, well, there's your answer. Don't do it then. So I said, what you've got to remember is you're accountable for your actions. That product's not licensed and therefore shouldn't be used. So I said, does the wound need honey? Not really, does it? I wouldn't have thought so. It probably just needs a little bit of a clean up, that surrounding skin cleaning up. We need to check to see if there's any undermining. So we can probe under there a little bit just to see if there is any undermining. And then it's just a case of putting a simple dressing on, keep it comfortable, keep it closed. Now, I would have argued that if I had picked this wound up at day one, post-operatively, I may have considered that this was a case for negative pressure to be applied. But at this point, I didn't think it was appropriate. We could use conventional dressings. So we effectively could use a hydrofiber and a foam dressing. That's all we needed to do. And we got the dietitian involved. The dietitian came in, brought in some supplements. We got him to talk about his weight, which obviously was a main, one of his main subjects is why he went through the procedure. And I tried to get him to change over to Hull Kingston Rovers, but it wasn't working. <laughs> but he did go on to complete healing just by the simple things. And again, when we then start to drill down, what we did was we used the triangle of wound assessment, if you like, to, to look at the tissue type, to look at the level of exudate, and try and match that to the way that we choose our dressings. So if you like, if you was ending up in a court of law and somebody says to you, right, 
Ness X, tell me what the level of exudate was. You can say, well, I use the triangle of wound assessment, and on this particular occasion, the volume of exudate was high. The actual viscosity of the exudate was quite thick. The viscosity coming away, so it was like custard that was coming away. I can also tell you the type of tissue that was on the wound bed at this given day and any one given day. I can also tell you whether there was any signs of infection. So effectively, you've already got a defence mechanism there. You've also got, if this wanted to be audited through the sequin, you've got this information there. Now, some of you may already be using tools similar to this. You might be using time. You might be using applied wound management. It's what we used to use. But maybe this is the next step on to cover your your back. Now, are you all using electronic records or are you still on paper? Paper. In some respects, paper is a lot easier to adapt this process into. Obviously, make sure you do work with your tissue viability nurse and your wound care managers to make sure that it's something that they'd be interested in looking at as well. But in paper copies, it's much easier to employ. Electronic records make it a little bit difficult or a little bit more difficult, shall we say. It's not impossible, it's not impossible, that reminds me of a song. It's not impossible to put this onto electronic records, you maybe just have to adapt it slightly. You cannot get some of the images, but it is doable, that's the word, it's doable. So, assessment of the wound edge as well. Again, from a legal point of view, documentation point of view, we can say on this given day that uh, we've got some maceration on this particular wound. Um, which you could argue whether you have or you haven't, but again, it gives you that outcome tracking of what's happening with your wound on that given day. On the next one, you're looking at the peri-wound skin. So is there anything else that we need to do? We've said we need to prepare it from a hair removal point of view. We need to protect it. We need to stop that maceration occurring. So we need to make sure that we get those dressings that absorb the fluid. We lock into that dressing and it doesn't laterally wick. If we do all these things, we're going to end up with some good outcomes for our patients. So we can address the wound bed, the wound edge and the surrounding skin. We can have a tick box, however you want to do it, so that you can just refer back to it. And should you, somebody say, I need to look at your documentation when I'm doing this root cause analysis in-house that could lead on to an SI in-house, that could lead on to a legal prosecution outside of house, you've got everything there in front of you. You can protect yourselves. So, the main aim for him was to remove the non-viable tissue, manage the exudate, manage the bacterial burden and protect the surrounding skin. All doable, now we've done that good holistic assessment. We can then go on to our dressing selection, which in this particular case, lo and behold, coloplaster suggesting, as this image would suggest, a biotin silicone. Don't know whether biotin's on your formulary? Simple yes or no, do well. Yeah, yeah, it is on your formulary, so that's fantastic. I have it on our formulary as well, and I, without doing a product promotion, I will challenge that this is probably one of the best, if not the best, uh, fluid handling, most comfortable, conformable foam dressing on the market. So that's why it's on our formery, quite honestly, for that reason. Um, case study two. This is a, a gentleman with a, well, you tell me what I've got there in front of me. What do you think that is? It could be diabetic and it could be peripheral vascular disease. There's a few things we need to look at. As Kirsty and Phil would say, location, location, location. So on the top of the foot, if you look at the way it presents, it's quite punched out, isn't it? It's quite defined, so that's telling us it's arterial. If you look at the toenail beds, there's no blood supply there, is there? So that's telling us, again, it's, it's probably likely to be arterial. Potentially, it could be diabetic. More likely if it was on the sole of the foot, though, if it was neuropathic. So this is possibly diabetic and arterial. But as it says in front of you, so the clue was there, so it shouldn't have taken 10 minutes. 84-year-old with underlying peripheral vascular disease. Yeah, not suitable for vascular intervention because the poor gent's got significant cardiac history to the point they've said that if they did any intervention, he would probably die on the table. So uh, all his request was, what can you do for me? You know, is there anything you can do to manage my symptoms? And his symptoms were um, that he had some dead and devitalised tissue. The dead and devitalised tissue was harbouring uh, bacterial burden. The bacteria was causing pain and suffering and excoriation of the surrounding skin. And also there was that malodor. 
and all he wanted, if I'm really, really honest, was to be uh, symptom free or to have those symptoms manage as best as he could for the remaining few weeks of his life. And he, he, his story was that he said, I don't want my family to come and remember me as having a stinky foot where I'm in lots of pain and, and it's going to affect my mood. I want the, you know, to be in the best possible mood that I can be with no odour uh, and be infection free so I can have that last bit of quality time with my family and that's what we managed to achieve for him. Again, it will cover your back from a documentation point of view but it will help you ask the question, what do I need to do to help my patients either manage those symptoms or potentially heal whichever your aim and objective is at the beginning of your assessment. <coughs> so case study three. If you look at this one, this is a lady who's only in, well, she's only in her 40s. Um, I, I say this, she's younger than me now. Uh, she's had recent surgical uh, intervention for a ganglion removed. So this is on her lower ankle. She is a smoker and she's got no other further comorbidities at this particular time. Now then, if you was looking at this particular patient and you're looking at the triangle of wound assessment, what sort of things is the problems that you see before you? So with the wound, you've got slough, the surrounding skin, maceration, and the re remainder of the skin, it's a little bit dry looking, isn't it? Not, not exceptionally dry, but the beginnings have been dry. And that potentially is because it's covered. Now then, so you've identified she's got slough. There is some buds of granulation there. There are some big issues with the surrounding skin. If you look at the wound uh, bed, is there something that you can identify maybe in the front rows that would tell you something else? You won't see it on the back rows, I don't think. What is it? Granulation, granulation but what else? Something that might prevent it from healing. Potential infection. Something else, look really closely. Could be a biofilm, that's an interesting one. Whoever said biofilm, biofilms, just very quickly while you're thinking about what else you can see, potentially exist in 100% of all chronic wounds. So you've got to think of a way of busting those biofilms as quick and as effectively as you can. Um, the problem that we have as TVNs and as wound care practitioners amongst yourselves, we don't know which and how many of these 100% of biofilms are actually detrimental or will delay the wound healing process. But maybe we should introduce routine cleansing of the wound bed to disrupt the biofilm. Anybody still yet found my little thing in the picture? It's very fine, that's your clue. It's something that I can no longer grow effectively. Hair, yes. I'm, I, that was worrying that you guessed it when I said I couldn't grow it. <laughs> Can anybody see on the front? There's a, I'm going to have to move from this lectern. Just one there, look, waving through, and another one there, and it goes on to the hydrocolloid. Can you not see it? it it's, I'm sorry, I do apologise for the quality of the image, but... On there, there's two hairs going through. Now, again, the same as the other ge gentleman, this will act as a foreign body. What the lady had been doing, she'd been taking a dressing off, getting showered, and she'd got hairs into the wound, which was acting as a foreign body. Then she'd been applying the dressing back on top. Now then, some brights back had decided to give her a hydrocolloid dressing that's this big when the wound is only that big. And you've got the hydrocolloid beads that have stuck to the surrounding skin. And instead of them being removed at each dressing change, they've just been putting the dressing back on over the top. Anyway, I was asked to go in by the consultant to ask if I could put some negative pressure onto this patient. Does that require negative pressure? No. no. So I said, well, I'll go and have a look, and if it's appropriate, I will. But as it turns out, breaking the skin integrity below the knee, going towards chronicity, my first plan, do a holistic assessment, do my triangle of wound assessment, do a Doppler A BPI just to make sure the blood supply is good. Start to prepare the wound bed, clean up the surrounding skin, hydrate the remainder of the skin and put an appropriate size dressing on that's going to manage that wound more appropriately. Then all I need to do is put a little bit of compression on and reverse that venous hypertension. It takes four weeks to heal. Is she happy? You would hope so. But no, she wasn't. Because the reason why the consultant got all flappy and wanted negative pressure on, it was one of these no win, no fees. 
She didn't think she should have a chronic wound on her leg from having a ganglion removed, so she was suing him for it. When in actual fact, I'm sure, when you sign a consent to have surgical uh, procedure done, it says, in the small print, you may be at risk of developing an infection and wound breakdown may occur. You sign it. So to me, you, she didn't potentially have a leg to stand on. <laughs> Pardon the pun. But, literally. Yeah, literally. But she went on to complete healing, and in my opinion, that was a good outcome. And she needed a little bit of compression hosiery after healing, and that was it, jobs are good. Un. But again, it's about making sure you paint that picture. Use your triangle of wound assessment to back up your holistic assessment and diagnosis. Make sure you've documented it. If you're involved in root cause analysis, whether you're the ones that have been involved in the direct patient care or whether you're the ones that are doing the root cause analysis, it's the same themes that keep coming up. Communication. Are we all speaking to each other using the same terms? And documentation. Are we writing down what we've done or what we've not done? And this may be a way of helping you making sure that you cover your back. So, ideal dressing is one that maintains a moist environment, manages wound exudate. It should be atraumatic to your patient. It certainly shouldn't shed fibres into the wound because it could act as a foreign body. It should have good skin adhesion. It could aid debridement if that's appropriate, but please make sure only start debriding using autolysis or whatever methods you use once you've done your holistic assessment. Question, who does debridement in the room? Just put your hands up. Anybody debrad? I will say to you all that you all do. If you are wound care practitioners, you all debride one way or another. You put a dressing on that creates a warm, moist environment that helps the body to autolytically debride the wound. So you're facilitating it. It's funny because every time I ask this, people go, ooh, no, like that. They think, yes, I do, but then they decide, no, they don't. Because they think, I mean, do, do I get a scalpel and start debriding? But you, it might not necessarily be scalpel. You might be using larvae. You might be using Debrisov. You might even be using gauze. Hopefully not, but you might be. Um, you, might, you might have, if you come from my day and era, that you was using hydrogen peroxide and, and things like that to debride. Just out of interest, does anybody um, still use hydrogen peroxide? No, nobody. Can I just have a definite, no, I don't? No, I don't. Does anybody use honey? Yeah. 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 Right then, do you know how honey works? It has an osmotic draw, doesn't it, that can cause some pain as it's drawing the fluid out of the wound. And, and it has got very good beneficial effects at cleaning, uh, debriding and reducing odour. But how does it work? When it reacts with oxygen, it creates hydrogen peroxide. And it's an antimicrobial for that reason. So what I'm trying to say is that yes, you potentially do, but more in a natural form. So always read the leaflet so that you can give the right education and advice to your patient. This may cause you a little bit more pain, so we'll give you some analgesia whilst we clean up this wound bed. So always be aware of the dressings that you're using. It should keep the uh, wound bed close to body temperature because that's the ideal temperature. And ultimately, in this day and age, it should be cost effective. As I was driving here today, if you vote Labour, they're going to give the NHS workers an increase in pay. How are they going to pay for that? They're going to tax you at the other end. <laughs> so, last case, case study four. Patient is a, a very elderly lady in her nineties, lives with her husband, and as you can see, she's uh, got this chronic wound caused by pressure damage. The pressure damage is caused because she's got curvature of the spine. Um, and she lives in a lovely little cottage overlooking a bit of a beck thing and she's lived there all her married life and it turns out she slept on the same bed all her married life as well and she's been married since the 20s so this bed's effectively 70 years old nearly. Now this bed, I hate to say, I've never seen anything like it, it had like wires, coils which I know you're getting a new bed, but these were like metal, almost springs that you get on a car, coils, and then it had a, la a layer of what looked like a fibrous straw on top. And it, it was coming out, bits of it were coming out. But one of these coils had obviously penetrated where she laid on her back. 
Now, whether she's got some neuropathic changes that has, has altered the, her effective pain through, from the back to the brain, and she's thinking, oh, I, I can't feel this, but she'd been laying on it for a good period of time. District nurses had been going in and trying to get her to change uh, her position and such like. She was having none of it. I went round, husband's 94 years of age, he was an ex, I don't know what he was, paratrooper or something, he decides he's going to square up to me because I'd suggested she needed to be in a profile in bed with a, a dynamic mattress whilst we come to terms with this wound bed. So he said, you're not putting her in a different bed. So I said, well, what about respite care then so that she could be managed? Oh, hell no, that was it. I was going to punch down the stairs. So I said, what about a topper, at least something so that you can stay together? He was having none of it. If it involved him not sleeping in that same bed with his wife, no chance. And she said exactly the same and they both had capacity. So I said, look, if I start to look at you and your wound bed, your surrounding skin, if you look at this, I've got big problems, haven't I? I've got slough, I've got inflammation, I've got the potential for maceration and further breakdown. But the big problem is I've still got the pressure point going into a back. If I can't take that away, I'm not going to get an outcome. So we either enter into this dialogue and we make a change, or unfortunately this potentially will kill her. But she was having none of it. Anyway, in the end, she allowed us to get her this topper thing that overlaid, and she agreed to have the bed spring taped over and this topper on top which again wasn't going to you know, relieve the problem as such. So I documented it using the triangle of wound assessment, so I had effectively some sort of uh, uh, cover protection for myself from an accountability point of view, and so did the nurse. Um, we looked at it with regards to devising our management plan as what we was going to do. I offered to debride this lady's back, which I did debride. Uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately, as I debrided away that yellow slough, it all guggled and bubbled, and all this exudate came pouring out because it was all undermining as well. And as that did, the bacteria was released, and so was the odour and everything. And it started to clean up. Um, but unfortunately, because the pressure was still there, the wounds started to deteriorate. The effect, infection started to come back in, became systemic, no matter what we tried to do, and she died, unfortunately, because of this wound. But effectively, that was her choice. She was given all options, and she chose to go down that route with her husband. What, <laughs> what you must do, and no, this isn't my dad, as people have questioned, is that your dad? <laughs> no, no, it's my brother. Um, um, what we must do is, one, try and avoid this. Two, make sure that we get the best possible care that we can provide for our patients. But please look after yourselves. In this world of litigation, look after <laughs> yourselves. Documentation is critical. If you're not using a tool of assessment, then maybe the triangle of wound assessment is something that you could employ within your organisation that will allow you to protect you, protect your patient, give you a management plan, make sure you've got a clear diagnosis and make sure you're following that pathway that you try not to deviate off. So choosing the right dressing at the right time, like I said at the beginning, um, is critical in attempting to achieve the aims and objectives. Be clear and concise with your aims and objectives. We must use that systematic evidence-based approach to wound management to ensure that we understand the phases of healing. Again, it's critical that we do that. We're all professionals, we are responsible. We also must work as part of a multidisciplinary team to make sure that we get the best outcomes. We don't know everything about everything, do we? So let's use those people that work with us. And, and that's it for me. Can I just remind you, if you want some hard copies of this, uh, and certainly the tool in practice, get yourself to the Coloplast stand at the break, and there'll be plenty of information for you there. So thank you very much for that. Um, any questions before I disappear, before the blokes in black usher me off? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.